Since we were all introduced during the last intermission, I'll just repeat your names, then we'll get right, right down to our game. Seated before me are Gerald Fitzgerald, George Jelinek, and our official quiz master, Edward Downs. This time, I'm happy to say, answering rather than asking the questions. Well, I'm seated at the Knabe, and all my questions for you three gentlemen involve my playing a little bit of music. So, I look forward to your erudite answers. It's as simple as that. Here is the first question. Operatic characters have more perils than Pauline, according to G. Bennett of Englewood, New Jersey. But sometimes the heroines turn out to be the ones who rescue their men from breathtaking perils. See if you can recognize these rescue scenes from the music I'm going to play. This lady saves her men as much by her eloquent words as by her brave action. What does she save him from and how does it all end? <laughs> What does she save him from? Mr. Downs, do you have any idea? I recognize the music, but I'm an absolute blank. Play it again, <laughs> please. Oh, I don't have to play it again, I don't think. Mr. Fitzgerald. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jelinek. It's a big boat. <laughs> Now, let me say this. Does that remind you of any lady calling? That is Minnie in the Fanchula del West. When and what happens? What happens? Why is she well, doing this? She, she saves him on several occasions. Mr. But the, Downs. But the last one that I remember rather vividly from the original libretto, which I think they no longer print that way, is she comes riding in on horseback, her hair streaming, and a pistol between her teeth. Oh, real. Now, this I never heard before. Yes, that was the original stage directions. <clears throat> However, she still does come in on a horse. <laughs> yeah. Most sopranos don't like that, but no, still she I does. I think Marjorie that. Lawrence yes. would like that. <laughs> All right, here is the second. This operatic rescue scene goes through a whole series of terrible crises until we know the man is safe at last, when we hear this. That's all you allow me to play. <laughs> all three hands are up. <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald. It's Fidelio of Beethoven, and Leonora has come into the dungeon and saved her husband by concealing a gun, and just as his murderer is about to kill him, she leaps forward and she says, kill first his wife, and everyone is astounded, and then the trumpet call comes from off stage, and they find that the uh, governor is coming, and that indeed everyone is saved, and the villain will get his just rewards. And uh, what is his name? Pizarro. The oh, governor. Or oh, 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 the, the husband? The savior. The savior is Leonore in Fidelio. No, naturally, but I mean, who arrives finally? The gentleman da, in the white Fernand wig. Don Fernando. Please, Mr. Don Jelinek. The governor, uh, Mr. Fizio. Mr. Downs. Yes, it's the Agreed. governor, Don Fernando. Fernando. Yes. Don Fernando. Fernando. Fernando? I, I think. Fernando Fernando. I think Fernando. Fernando is in Trovatore. I'm not quite sure of myself. <laughs> so, tell us now what determined lady rescues her man as we hear this music, which of course you will know immediately. I'm determined to finish this one. 
Mr. Downs. You play it so beautifully, I hoped you would finish it. Well, thank uh, you. That was about two minutes ago that she saved it. Exactly. Uh, uh, very dramatically, after uh, Escamillo had spared Jose's life several times, and Jose insisted on tacking again, uh, Escamillo slipped, Jose was about to stab him, and in rushed Carmen and... She says... Hola, Jose. Exactly. <laughs> well, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, with the centennial just around the corner, revolutionary uprisings and rebellions are in the air. And, of course, opera is rich in rebels and rebellions. Mrs. Hans Surf of Elmhurst, New York, wants to see how good is your ear for revolutions. I'll play you the music. You explain who is rebelling against whom and why, and how does it all end? <laughs> We go with the hands again, fast. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald? That's Norma in the last act, and the Druids are rebelling against the Romans, and yes. Norma is uh, inciting them at this moment. Yes, and what does she say? Guerra, guerra. Strage, guerra. In sangue, sangue. Yes, exactly. Then she changes her mind later oh, on. Oh, well, women always change their mind. <laughs> <laughs> There is something quite unusual about this scene of rebellion, and we would like to know what it is. Downs, his Marvelous. hand is up. <laughs> you could get all those voices going because that's a fugue, isn't it? Yes, it is indeed. Now, it was, uh, it, that must be in the revised version of uh, Verdi's Macbeth. Macbeth, yes? correct. And the, the people who are revolting are, let me see, they're the people of Scotland? Yes, the people of Scotland under Malcolm, I believe. Anyway, they're revolting against Macbeth. The English soldiers, I believe, headed by Malcolm and Macduff. And they are revolting mm. against, against Macbeth, Macbeth. Yes. exactly. And uh, Verdi writes something very interesting. He says, uh, the musical form of this fugue that I've composed with a continual succession of subject and counter subject, the clash of dissonances, the general din can describe a battle well enough. I am not quite of the same opinion. I don't know how everybody else is. I think his last fugue, the one that is most important, I think, mm is uh, Tutto nel mondo. Uh, but anyway, so oh, this here one we have um, the third. I, I, I think it was pretty good. That, uh, that mm. comes off very well. Well, after 30 years, he says, I have finally decided that I'm going to write a fugue. Mm. That's what he wrote to Esquidier. Uh, now, the next one. Now, tell us what the real intention of the composer is in this revolutionary scene, and who are the people involved? composer must be Verdi. Absolutely. And I believe this is Nabucco. I'm afraid not. Mr. Fitzgerald, would you like to take a crack at it? The strange thing is I was singing the words to myself, something about, uh, something like que sera, sera. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Mr. Will be Jelinek. Attila? Si ridesti il si ridesti leone. Ernani. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Downs, you had your hand up. Yes, I was going to say it's a, it's a revolt uh, uh, against uh, the man who's going to be named Charles V, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. 
And it's, it's one of those revolutionary choruses that Verdi wrote in so many operas where the audience got all excited and identified themselves exactly. as Italians. And, and uh, it was unbearably exciting. They used to join in yes. the chorus and roar these things and encore them and, and so on. It must have been tremendous. Yes, exciting. instead of the Lion of Castile, it was the Lion of St. Mark the at that particular time in yes. Venice. Yes, Free, free that Venice. They identified with. Yes. Practically a national anthem. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's true, yes. Well, here comes the other question. Operatic characters tell a lot of lies, and they say opera isn't true to life. Huh? And according to Inga Hurley of Stamford, Connecticut, even the nicest of characters will tell white lies to protect another person. I'm going to play you some music, and you panelists are to tell me who is protecting whom, how, and what is the white lie, etc., etc. Who is telling this white lie and who is being protected? Yes, Mr. Uh, Jelinek. The opera is The Marriage of Figaro. Yes, and what is the situation? And the situation is uh, quite complicated. Uh, Figaro is trying in his uh, bumbling way to uh, protect Cherubino, who had just jumped out of the window. And uh, with the assistance, Figaro is trying to explain the situation with the assistance of the Countess and Susanna. Yes. And at this point, he is not doing so well because now he has to explain why he isn't, uh, why he wasn't hurt in a fall. He's trying to pretend that he was Carubino. Well, and he does sort of. And he does he, imitate uh, yes, the hurt sort of, and uh, il pie, something about sorry, il pie. So he sort of so, limps around. Yes. Okay. Well, Mr. Downs. I just wanted to say that the the point of recognition for me is that ba ta tum ba ta tim sal tai ju that's exactly jumping right. down jumping down jumping yeah. down <laughs> so good. here is a real catchy one from Ra ralph postiglione of albertson new york it's about the first and last words of opera i'm going to play for you the first words we hear sung in an opera and you tell me what the words are and who sings them and then tell us, or sing for us, that would be better, if you can, the last words of the same opera. If you can't sing them, then I'll try to play them for you. So here are our first opening words. Mr. Fitzgerald. I know I'm wrong, but I'm going to say Faust. No, you are in the uh, sort of French repertoire, yes, but not Faust. Then it's Romeo. Sorry again. <laughs> <laughs> it is Samson and Delilah, mm. where the chorus opens and says, God of Israel, hear the prayer of your children. Mm. Do come to our aid somehow. And what is the end of it? The end of Samson and Delilah. They all shriek, ah. Oh. That's true, but I mean, what does, what does he say before that? Uh, well, Samson says something, words to the effect, oh Lord, give me my former strength back before he pushes the columns and the, the temple falls down. down. Exactly. Shall I play it for you? Yes. yes.
think you should now recognize this last one with no trouble at all. But I do wish, if you recognize it, to please sing with me on it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs>